Obviously, one of the biggest differences between a gasoline car and an electric car is that an electric car has an electric motor. We got our electric motor out of a forklift and I've got a different motor here to just show you the basics of how a series wound electric motor works. All electric motors work basically the same. We're going to be using a series wound forklift motor. In any motor, it's one magnetic field pressing against another magnetic field that makes the motor spin. Now there's more than one way to do that. Uh, in smaller motors, it might be a permanent magnet motor. That means one of the set of magnets are mineral magnets, permanent magnets. And then the other magnetic field is created by an electromagnet, the electricity from the batteries through the motor. Now those motors are limited in power because of how, how strong those permanent magnets are. Now if you instead have two electromagnetic fields pushing against each other to spin the motor, um, that's typically a series wound motor. There are some other style motors, uh, we're not going to cover those. Also this is a DC motor. DC motors uh, use electricity straight from batteries. They don't need any circuitry that converts the DC power of the batteries to AC to then run an AC motor. So these are going to be the most simple, durable, robust, powerful motors that you're going to be easily able to get your hands on. And we have just tons of electric forklifts uh, all over the place in factories, in warehouses, and in junkyards. So if you go to a junkyard, odds are that you can find a pretty good motor for not much money. So let's take a look at some of the parts on this motor here. Uh, this came out of a forklift. This was the drive motor. Uh, the style of forklift was one of those kind of three-wheeled ones where there was a single drive wheel in the back and the whole motor rotated on that wheel to steer. Uh, this is a series wound motor. Right up here we have an identification plate that tells us a little bit about it. Uh, it tells us that it's a 36 volt motor. Um, it also has a part number on there, which we could go on the internet, look up and find some more information on this motor. Now I took a couple of bolts off the end here just to open it up a little bit, make it a little easier to see in here. But to uh, start with, um, from over here, this is the drive end, the drive shaft. And if I spin this, you can see inside here, it's not just the drive shaft that's spinning, but there's also a large electromagnet inside that's uh, all part of it, that all rotates together. That whole assembly is called the rotor or the armature. Now you also see right inside here is a bearing and the same on the back. So that entire uh, rotor or armature and the drive shaft is all supported on those two bearings. Uh, the whole electric motor is really a very straightforward thing. We've got um, kind of this end cap, that end cap, the middle part, and that armature. That's, there's really only about four parts to this whole thing. So it's really easy to take apart. Typically to take it apart, you're gonna have maybe four or six bolt holes on the end. You pull those bolts out. Um, if you have any bolts on the opposite end, you'll pull those out too. And then you just need to yank this whole thing off and you wanna support the shaft as you do that so that uh, the inside parts don't whack against each other and damage the motor. Now another thing you're going to notice on this motor is that there's four power connections and you're thinking, uh oh, this doesn't make sense because a battery only has two power connections, a positive and a negative. So the motor should have a positive and a negative as well. Well, that's true, sort of. This is a series wound motor and that means that the electricity that runs through the inside, the armature, and makes that electrical field and the electricity that runs through the field coils, these magnets that are on the outside, the stator, uh, it's all the same electricity and it runs in series between the two. It runs through the one and then it loops and goes through the other and then goes back to the battery. So that's what the four power connections are for. Two of these are for the armature and two of them are for the stator. So on a motor that has four power connections on it, what we're going to do is uh, use a cable or some piece of uh, copper bar to connect two of the power connectors to each other. Now another thing that's kind of interesting here is how you run a series wound motor the opposite direction. If you put the motor in the car and the motor spins the wrong way, you're gonna have multiple gears of reverse and only one forward gear. So we wanna make sure the car goes forwards. Uh, the trick with this is if you find that the motor spins the wrong direction, you simply reverse that crisscrossing power cable so that that way we're reversing the power only on the one magnetic field or the other, not both. If we just swapped the connections on the battery cable, 
we'd be reversing both fields and the motor would still spin the same direction. Now, if you only have two power connections on there, uh, it could possibly be a permanent magnet motor or the other possibility is it's still a series wound motor, but that connection is on the inside and you can reverse that. It's just going to be a little bit more work because you got to take this whole thing apart, go in, find that wire, cut it and redo that yourself. So that's a little bit of a pain. Uh, four connections makes this a lot easier. Also, if you want, you could set up your car to have a power switch that makes your motor spin uh, either direction. Now in my car, I didn't do that. I only designed it to go the one direction and I just used reverse gear. Now some motors not only have a drive shaft, but they'll also have a tail shaft coming off the other end. The motor that I chose to use for my car did have a tail shaft on it, but I actually ended up having to cut it off because the motor was too long to fit in the front of the car. That tail shaft would have gone right into the passenger side tire and that would have been not good for anybody. Now on your motor, it may actually have a horsepower rating on this little identification plate right here. The most important thing to keep in mind for horsepower on an electric motor is it has almost nothing to do with horsepower on a gasoline engine. They really are that different. For example, I also have an electric motorcycle and the motor on that's rated for eight horsepower. And yet without a transmission, I can just twist my throttle and stick right on the tail of any Harley, no problem. Uh, horsepower really doesn't mean a whole lot on electric motors. They have a lot of torque. They just have that oomphy go power. And in my Metro, I can actually start from a dead stop in any gear, including fifth, without a clutch. That's the difference between torque and horsepower. Another thing that we'll notice on a motor like this is that it uses a face mount design. We're able to put bolts through from this face portion into the adapter plate. And that's what's actually going to hang the motor onto the transmission. Some other motors, sometimes they might have a, a foot coming off the bottom. And if we were using a motor like that, we would have to make some sort of an L-shaped adapter plate for the motor to sit on the foot and then still line up with, uh, with the transmission and that adapter plate for everything to go together. So let's take just a little bit closer look at this motor here. As I said, I already pulled out the, uh, the bolts out of the end of it. So what I'm gonna do now is we're just real gently gonna pull this motor apart. So now you have a little bit better view. Here we've got our drive shaft. Here's the drive shaft. You can see it has a keyway on there and that's what would be used to attach it to a pulley or some other power connection. Through the middle here, uh, this is our electromagnet. This is what all the electricity goes through and creates a magnetic field as it spins. Uh, this right here, believe it or not, is not bubble gum, but rather when they make the motor, they add a little bit of a putty weight that uh, balances the motor so that it, it stays nice and smooth as it spins. Down here, this is the end bearing. And this part right here is called the commutator. And the commutator is a, a pretty important part of the motor. Uh, what happens there is each of these copper bars is separated by a slot and these go over through this copper, through the iron, and creates the magnetic field. And because each of these is separated, every time the brushes hit one of these from one to the next, it alternates the electric field to make a push-pull, push-pull effect that uh, spins the motor around like this. Now inside the shell here, this is one of the coils. This motor has four of them. Some motors might have six. Uh, basically, they're just uh, uh, copper coiled around a iron block inside there, and that's the magnetic field that this one fights against to make the spinning motion. Now, in the very back of this, we've got the brushes, and the commutator here lines up with the brushes. Now, also, over here, this is usually called the drive end, sometimes abbreviated DE, and here and over here, is called the commutator end, sometimes abbreviated as CE. Now what you're looking at is the inside of the motor. Around the edges, you can see those uh, field coils right here. Uh, when you get your motor and pull it apart, you're gonna wanna take a look at that coils and make sure that the varnish doesn't look like it's worn off. If it is, you may want to pull out the screws that hold these in take them out, clean them up, and re-varnish them. I did that with just a, a can of uh, a spray-on green varnish. It really worked great. And it was just, uh, oh, an hour or two in the afternoon to really clean that all up. 
In the back are the brushes. And the brushes are basically just carbon, uh, little blocks of carbon that conduct the electricity. And they have little springs. So you can see here how uh, the brush can slide up and down as it's pressed in with that little spring. Well, what you're going to want is some sort of a, uh, a screwdriver or a pick or something. You can stick that through from the outside and pull back the spring. And then when you do that, you can slide the brush up and let the spring press back against it to hold the brushes out of the way. And you're always going to want the brushes held out of the way when you're trying to get the armature in and out. Now you also want to inspect those brushes to make sure they don't look burnt, that they're not cracked, um, that they're in, in good condition. Um, if you need new brushes, they are commonly available. Uh, consult the Yellow Pages or the internet to find a forklift repair shop somewhere near you. And brushes ran me about $50. Uh, mine were, were in really bad condition. There wasn't much left to them, so I needed new ones. So I paid 50 bucks for the motor, 50 bucks for the brushes, and uh, you know, five bucks for the can of epoxy. And with a little elbow grease, I basically had a brand new motor for about $100. Here is another view of the commutator end. Uh, this time I've got the commutator end bolts removed just to make a little room so we can see in here. Um, this here is the commutator itself. Here's one of the brushes. Um, that brush is pulled back right now. This little spring holds it in there. So if we pull that back, that lets us slip the brush in. And then that little hook goes right over the top of the brush to push it down just gently against the commutator. Now it's not going to do it right, right now because we've got this pulled apart, but just to show you how that works. So we do just want to make sure that all the brushes are pulled back when we slide that back in there. And again, always be careful with the commutator and how things line up so you're not bashing anything around on the inside there. So we'll just use this little uh, scribey, punchy thing here to pull that. Pull the brush back out, let the spring rest on the side of the brush, and it'll keep it held out in the outward position like that. So the motor that I ended up using for my project came out of a Nissan forklift motor. It really didn't have an identification plate on it. In fact, the thing was just amazingly rusty when I got it. I bought it for 50 bucks out of a guy's garage where it was still in a forklift motor that he was taking apart. He was using the hydraulics to build a, uh, a lift for his car, for his garage. Um, I did make sure that the motor itself spun first. I brought with me one of those uh, portable jump starter devices, kind of the, the battery with the jumper cables on it. And I put that on the motor, just put you know, put the two connections right on the power posts and I brought with an extra little piece of cable to make the connections. And it did spin barely. I actually had to uh, spin the drive shaft first and then it went, but it spun. So I figured that was a good sign. I brought the motor home. I took all the end bolts out. I took the motor apart. I cleaned it up. I revarnished the field coils. I got all the grease out of there. I put it all back together. It was basically a couple hours worth of work. And when I was done, I basically had a brand new motor. The brushes I picked up at a local forklift repair place. I paid $50 for a set of four brushes, brand new. They had them right there in stock. Uh, very easy to replace. You just have to pull the old ones out, uh, pull out one screw that holds in the electrical connector for the brush, uh, put the new one in, put that screw back in, slide the brush back into position, and you're ready to go again. Electric motors are very simple and very durable. I can't imagine taking apart a gasoline engine and rebuilding it in one afternoon. I wouldn't even know where to start. But an electric motor, for me never having done this before, it really wasn't that tough. So take a look around. You should be able to find a good used serial, series wound forklift motor at uh, a junkyard, possibly through someplace like Craigslist. You might want to check around at uh, uh, electrical rebuilders, repair shops. There might even be a forklift rebuilding place near you. Give them a call, see what you can find, and I'm sure you'll be able to find a good used motor for not too much money.